I'd like to begin by reading just a verse or two at the beginning of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now in this first verse, we have a microcosm, if you will, of the church. We have the saints in Christ Jesus with the bishops or elders and deacons. Church government is simple and clear in the word of God and it is adequate in every circumstance. It's been designed so that wherever people are saved and gathered together the Lord is able to raise up from their very midst godly shepherds who will care for them and safely lead them home. And so as we think about the subject, we recognize that it was God's design, it was his purpose, and God knew it would not be easy. It wouldn't be easy for the shepherds and it wouldn't be easy for the sheep. As some of you have heard me say before, there are perfect elders. Unfortunately, they're all in heaven. And the ones we have, well, they're not perfect. Of course, we're not perfect either, are we? And so we face the fact that wherever we have people, we have problems. And the Lord knew that he was putting us into a vulnerable situation because we were to submit to men who would not always perhaps be right or make the right decisions. And he knew that when he designed the church, but he set in certain safeguards, and we're going to see some of those this evening, safeguards that were intended to preserve the flock and the assembly that it might be ordered and uh, governed according to his will. Now, before we get into the subject of elders, uh, we have a little unfinished business over on page 16, I'd like to think with you a little bit about the subject of deacons. There are several words that are used for servants in the New Testament, uh, one of them being a bond slave, a name which the Apostle Paul took for himself, but not a name that the Lord gave his disciples. He said, I haven't called you bond slaves. There's a second word that we're quite familiar with. It's the word steward. That is someone who has a responsibility, the care of a household. Uh, in other words, he has in his hands another man's goods and he is responsible to be a faithful steward. It's required of a steward that he be faithful. There's a, another word that is quite commonly used for being a servant, and it's the word from which we get our English word deacon. And in Acts chapter 6, we see a situation develop where some of the Greek believers felt that their widows were not being adequately cared for. And uh, they brought the issue to the apostles uh, who were functioning as elders in the fledgling church. And and so the elders said to these Greek believers, you select out seven men, men of a certain caliber, men filled with the Holy Spirit, men that you can trust, and uh, we will hand over to them 
as a local fellowship, we will hand over to them certain responsibilities. And, and so it came that a group of men became the deacons of the church. Now, I've given you a little chart on page 16 uh, to suggest that there are some clear distinctions between elders and deacons. The deacon, first of all, was selected by the Christians, by the believers in the local fellowship, rather than appointed by God. Uh, we'll see the difference if we go over to the story of Moses when his father-in-law said, uh, son, you're, you're going to be uh, crushed by this workload. You need some helpers. And so uh, Moses himself appointed 70 small claims court judges to help him with the caseload. However, when the elders in Israel were to be selected, it wasn't left up to uh, individual men. It was something that was the very work of God. God selected the elders. And so we have in uh, the first clear difference between elders and deacons, the elders represent the Lord. And so he selects them. They are his under shepherds in the local church. Whereas the deacons act as representatives on behalf of the Christians in the local fellowship. They have a stewardship. It may be looking after the widows. It may be looking after a building or a Sunday school bus or uh, some other uh, work which is a stewardship and they are entrusted with this on behalf of the local church. And so they were selected uh, by the Christians who saw in these men a dependability, a faithfulness, and a godly character which they trusted. And so they handed over a stewardship to them. We notice as we read that story, the same word is used for the apostles who said, we will give ourselves to the ministry, that's the word uh, deaconship, if you will, we will give ourselves to the service of the word of God, and these men will give themselves to the service of tables, or as it is, uh, the, the, the distribution of food uh, to the widows. As far as I can tell from the New Testament then, it's quite possible to have a functioning biblical local church without deacons. If, for example, you had a group of Christians meeting in a house uh, they didn't have a building to look after. They didn't have a great deal of uh, funds. They, well, there was no need for deacons. The, deacon, the need for deacons arose when the elders became distracted and overburdened with material responsibilities. And so the role of the deacon was essentially to take part of the load off of the elders, and the Christians were happy to entrust this stewardship to them. You'll notice, secondly, that the deacons assisted in more material matters. Uh, the elders were freed up by this to deal with more spiritual tasks. This does not mean that the deacons are not spiritual men. They were required to be, and Stephen, who is featured for us in that story, was a deeply spiritual man. He was an excellent uh, preacher of the gospel, he was uh, able to, without notes, without being able to rush home and get his outline, stand before the Sanhedrin and give a flawless presentation of the history of the nation of Israel from start to finish. It's a masterpiece, isn't it, in chapter 7. So when we see these men, they are not also rands. They are not men who didn't quite qualify to be elders. Oh, well, we'll give you something to do. You can fix the furnace. That's not the idea. These were godly men. In fact, I sometimes think you need more faith, more spiritual vision when you're lying on the floor in the middle of the night trying to fix something before the Lord's Day morning than men like elders who are functioning with obvious spiritual materials. They're working with lives and families and so on. So uh, these men needed to have a keen spiritual vision to see the spiritual implications of the material things with which they were working. The Bible never speaks about money as money. 
It looks upon it as fellowship, as a resource, a spiritual resource, which we are to use for the glory of God. And so the work of a deacon is not something that is to be demeaned. It is a valid ministry. The scripture says true religion is to visit the fatherless and widows. And it's one of the roles of the deacons to make sure that the people of God are cared for in this way. Then we notice that um, the work of the deacon was a kind of subset, wasn't it? Uh, all of us have been called to be deacons in the general sense of the word. We're all to be servants. And so the deacons aren't supposed to do all the work, all of the material work in the life of the local church. They are responsible and they are to be examples to us. But we shouldn't leave them to do all the work. We should be willing to work along with them. Just as it is with the spiritual dimension, the elders are not to do all the hospitality. They are not to do all of the ministry in the local church. They are to guide us and they are to be examples to us. But we are all to be involved in the life and work of the local church. So these men, elders and deacons should be examples to us and set guidelines for us and encourage us in the ministry which they themselves have been called to do. Now back to lesson seven. There may be some further questions regarding deacons a little later, but I, I leave that with you. And let me mention that there are several appendixes uh, that have to do with lesson seven. There's uh, appendix six, which is Paul's charge to the elders of Ephesus at Miletus, outlined for us in Acts chapter 20, and uh, you might find something helpful there. And also appendix seven, which uh, has some suggestions as to how the elders can maximize the use of their time. It's a very difficult thing these days for those who are husbands, who are employers or employees, uh, who are actively engaged in the life of their local assembly to also function as elders. And uh, there are some suggestions there regarding uh, ways to utilize time in functioning as an elder. And then Appendix 9 is a little outline of the, uh, the elder's joy, sources of joy in the life of the elder's life. It is not all grim slugging it out. <laughs> there are many the causes for joy, or should be, in the life of the elder. Well, um, I've made some general comments here in the second paragraph on page 25. Uh, first of all, I've already mentioned that the Lord knew he was putting us in a vulnerable position, a position that would call our hearts out to him. In other words, we can always go over the heads of the elders in prayer and to seek the Lord's blessing, to seek the Lord's help, to seek grace from heaven in dealing with the situation. If God was able to change the heart of King Nebuchadnezzar, he can touch the hearts of elders too, can't he? And so there's no reason why we should ever despair in the life of the local church. As long as the Lord is alive and well, if he has placed us there, and that's why it's so important that when we're identifying with a local church, that we have the confidence that God wants us there. It's not a matter of church shopping, looking around and saying, I think this is a nice place. It's a matter of having the conviction, the Lord put me here. And if you have that confidence that the Lord put you there, in the grim days, and there will be, in the dark and difficult days, we can look back and we can look up and we can say, Lord, this was your idea. I'm holding you responsible for this. <laughs> it was your design and you placed me here and I'm looking to you. And if you want, especially the sisters who find themselves very often not only uh, functioning in a situation with failing elders but also failing husbands and sometimes it gets very difficult for them, it's a great thing to go back and read the story of Hannah and her prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and how she rose above it when Eli was blind and insensible and unfeeling and um, accused her of being a, a daughter of Belial. 
And when her own husband was so insensitive as to say, I know you don't have any children, but you have me, dear, and that's better than ten sons, don't you think? I mean, what a mannish thing to say. In any case, uh, we see Hannah, how she rises above the situation, how she realizes the way God works in history, how he takes the things that are weak, the things that are nothing, the things that are a disadvantage, and he uses them to accomplish his purposes. It's a magnificent prayer, and it, it, it is a, a tremendous encouragement to those of us going through difficult times and wondering if we'll ever get out of the dark, if we'll ever see the, the day when joy will fill our hearts and we'll see God triumphing in the situation. It's a very helpful passage. No doubt the morning devotional of Mary, the day she prayed her magnificent Magnificat, which seems to be uh, very much a quotation or an adaptation of the words of Hannah. The second point I'd like to make is um, that the Lord designed the local church to keep us dependent on him. And there is no perfect church except those who are already in heaven. And so if we think that by leaving this local church and going to another local church, all our problems will be solved, uh, as David said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I'd fly away and be at rest. The problem is where you go, you go, and you open up your little kit bag and whoops, there you are again. Uh, we are the problem. I mean, people are the problem. We'd have some great local churches if it wasn't for the people. But <laughs> unfortunately, that's the way it is. And the Lord knew that, and he's willing to work with us. And we read those beautiful words from Philippians chapter 1, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. This is not the end product. We are in the throes. We are in process. And the Lord is not going to give up on us. And the last point I make in the introduction is this, that a bad local assembly can be a good school. All the things I need to learn about grace and patience and long-suffering and gentleness and love and kindness can probably be learned better in a bad local church than in a good one. Because I don't need those graces if everybody's sweet and happy, you see. It's when things are going through the hard, when we're struggling and having difficulty, that's when we discover that God has given us resources to deal with these situations. And as the scripture says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This is our secret weapon. Love is the secret weapon. Love never fails. And so in these circumstances, God has given us the resources in order not only to overcome, but to actually be purified through the process and to become more Christ-like in those times of stress and difficulty. By the way, Appendix 8 is a little section on uh, conflict resolution in the local church and a few suggestions on dealing with those issues that are going to come up whenever you work together. You're going to have friction and you're going to need some lubricant to help the uh, engine from seizing. Now, uh, I've given you a little definition of an elder. And there are three words that are commonly used for the elder. The first one, presbyteros, is a word that has been corrupted into priest. But we know that that's not true. We know that the presbyteros is not a priest alone. He is a priest along with all the other saints. But uh, this has been used by the sacerdotal churches to say that there are only certain people on the other side of the rail people who do special things, who administer the sacraments and so on, and they are priests, and the rest of us are spectators. But that's not the teaching of Scripture. We are all priests. Every child of God is a priest, but there are certain special uh, ministries that have been given to certain individuals in the local church, and they are called elders. The presbyters, if you will, are emphasizing their spiritual maturity. Now, it doesn't have to do with age, and when we think about maturity, it doesn't mean that they've been saved for 30 or 40 or 50 years. 
As far as we know, the most that Paul ever spent in seeing the development of elders was two years. That was the maximum. And he was starting with raw pagans and leaving with functioning elders. So the idea that you have to be a very old man before you can be an elder in the local church, we'll see the disqualification of those who are novices, but just the same, the idea of being an elder is not physical old age. Unfortunately, as the scripture says, not old, all old men are wise. And it's not a matter of age, physical age, it's a matter of spiritual maturity. And then secondly, the word bishop, which again has been misapplied. It's the word episkopos, which means overseer, an overseer. And the idea is that uh, sheep, uh, their eyes are only two inches off the ground when they're nibbling, and they can't see very far. And so they need those who are up on their hind legs, uh, pardon me, those standing up, who can see some distance and who can see the wolves coming and see the danger, the thieves and the robbers, and they watch over the people of God. They, they protect and care for and anticipate danger on behalf of the flock of God. And then we have the word shepherd, and uh, this illustrates not so much the maturity or the responsibility, but the actual functioning of the shepherd to feed and lead and take heed to the flock. I would point out one important distinction. Every elder must be a shepherd, but not every shepherd is an elder. There are women who shepherd younger women. There are young people who shepherd young people. Uh, there are people who um, are too elderly to bear the official load of the local assembly, but they can go on shepherding. I really don't think the idea is that a man is to be an elder until the day he dies. The problem with that is some Christians start praying for that because they, they feel he's outlived his, his usefulness in the local church. It's a sad thing when a man outlives his usefulness and is the last one to find out that he really isn't capable anymore. He isn't able anymore. There are physical issues. There are mental issues. And uh, sometimes a man gets to an age where he just isn't able to bear the official load. Well, he's, he's afraid to step down from the oversight because he feels that if he does, he's being asked to stop being a shepherd. He's not being asked to stop. He, we want him to go on caring for the flock. You don't have a heart transplant. He has a shepherd's heart and he cares for the flock. He prays for them. He encourages them. And we would look to him for, for counsel and, and encouragement. But bearing the official load of the local assembly is, is a vigorous work. It requires a healthy body. It requires a sound mind. And so I think if elders understood the distinction here, that it's quite possible to go on shepherding after you have passed the age when you're able to, to bear the load of the local fellowship, you may step down as an elder, that is, as an official representative of the assembly, but you can go on shepherding. You can go on visiting. You can go on caring and praying and encouraging. Absolutely. And I think we need to mark out that distinction. There are some men, and they have every other qualification to be an elder except one. They don't want to do it. They don't feel they can do it. And so the scripture says that it must not be by constraint, but willingly, and I knew a brother in our assembly, and he was a great shepherd, and he was out all the time. He, was, he wasn't willing to take the official load, the official position, to be an official representative of the assembly, and yet, at the same time, he went on doing a great shepherding work among the people of God. So there are maybe reasons for one, uh, there may be in many assemblies who, for example, are not prepared to take a single man on as an elder. I'm not sure that that's really a disqualification, but there are some who do. They say you have to have a wife, you have to have children in order to be an elder. And so he, he's, he's got a shepherd heart and he cares for the people of God, but as far as the assembly is concerned, they don't recognize him as an official elder. So there are, uh, I believe we, we need to understand that elders are a subset of all those who shepherd and care for the flock in the local assembly. I mention here that Titus 1, verses 5 and 7, demonstrates that elder and bishop are speaking about the same person. And that 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4 also shows 
that elders and shepherds in that context are talking about the same person. Only ecclesiastical bias has caused the distinctions of elder and bishop uh, and priest as we see it today. Now, the design of elder rule. It is not a despotic government. It is not a matter of a certain group of men or a particular man out of that group ruling with a heavy hand. The scripture says not lording it over God's heritage. It's not a matter of using uh, clout or uh, uh, pressure in order to force the people of God to do things. It's by moral suasion, it's by godly example, and it's by careful teaching of the word of God that we encourage the people to respond not to us, but to the Lord, the chief shepherd. That's the responsibility of elders. And anyone who has been a father uh, and has seen the children growing up knows there's a certain age at which you have to use something more than mere uh, emotional or uh, pressure or threat of punishment in order to get them to do things. Hopefully somewhere between the age of six months and 18, you find better ways to get them to eat their vegetables than if you don't eat your vegetables, I'll fill in the blank, right? Uh, that works when they're little, but as they grow up, there have to be other more persuasive ways to convince them that eating vegetables is a good thing. And that's why elders should have learned this lesson while they were raising their children. And they shouldn't be trying to use uh, a tactic that's good for two-year-olds with grown adults in the local church. It's not a matter of threats and pressure and embarrassment and the fear of blacklisting people that makes them want to do the things that please the Lord. We have other means, and those means are godly example, moral suasion, and the careful teaching of the word of God. So it is not despotic. Secondly, it is not democratic. You know, Laodicea means the voice of the people. And God did not design the church so it was one person, one vote. The problem with that system is that the least spiritual person's vote will over uh, will, will block out the most spiritual person's vote. We are not led by uh, individuals voting. We are led by the Spirit of God working in the hearts of God's people, responding to our godly leaders. Now, if there are decisions that are to be made in the local assembly that are going to affect the local assembly, the elders will want to know how the flock is thinking about these things. They're not dictatorial, they're not democratic, it's not a matter of voting, but the word episcope, episcopon, means to discover a need by visiting. And when the elders are in the lives and the homes of God's people on a regular basis, they come to know how the Lord's people are thinking about things. When someone is to be received into the local fellowship, it's not the elders who receive them, it's the, it's the whole assembly that receives them. Because every individual in that local church is agreeing to give away a little bit of their life to that person. I'm going to pray for you, encourage you, have you into my home. I'm going to exercise my gift for your enrichment. And so every Christian should have a part in that decision. It's not by voting. It's by the elders having a sense as to where people are, what they're thinking. And so if the elders are visiting in the homes of God's people on a regular basis and say now, we're, you know, we're considering this brother, uh, maybe the Lord's raising him up as an elder in our assembly. What do you think about that? One of the best things that a father can do or a husband can do is to sit down with his children or his wife and say, how do you think I'm doing as a father, as, an el as a husband? How, how do you think I'm doing? Would you not think that sometimes the elders would sit down perhaps with the young men in their assembly, and say, well, how, how are we doing? How, how's the ministry? What do you think of the ministry in the assembly? Because, you know, someday, 
the elders are going to give an account for it. Far better to find out before you get to the judgment seat how you've been doing than wait till there's no way of fixing it, right? I think it would be a good idea to sit down and to treat the people of God as if they have good minds too and they have spiritual discernment and to say to them, we want to do the best job we can. Are there areas that you think we could improve on? I think that would be a good thing. I think that's a good biblical way to manifest to the sheep that we care about them and we notice them and we appreciate them, we value them. And so when there's a, a matter to be discussed, to be decided in the assembly, not that every little thing we have to check with every person in the local church, no, but when there are major issues that are going to affect the whole assembly, it's a good idea to find out. And then you see, if you sit down with a widow who prays four or five hours a day for the local assembly, and you ask her what does she think, well, you're going to take that with a fair bit more weight than some upstart who just complains all the time, right? But you, I mean, you listen to them too. But you listen and you're able to put the weight then where it ought to be. It's not a democratic thing. On the other hand, it's not despotic either. Number three, it is not dereliction of duty. It's not a wall elders. It's not just sort of leaving the assembly to um, look after itself. The elders feel a burden. When there's someone who's sick, they're there. When there's someone who's discouraged, they're there. When there's someone who's lonely, they're there. When there's someone who's, who's starting to drift, they're there. And they say, we care about you, and we want to see you back, and we're concerned. Say something while it will do some good. Don't wait till they're gone and say, tut, tut, it's too bad, isn't it? It is too bad. And the responsibility of the shepherd was not to wait until the sheep called on their mobile and said, excuse me, but I, I'm some distance away. I wonder if you could come and get me. In the story Jesus told, the shepherd noticed the sheep was gone and he went looking for him and he brought him back, not spanking him all the way home. He brought him home rejoicing. And that's the heart of the shepherd who loves the sheep and doesn't think it's untoward that he has to go out in the middle of the night to go and find one of them and bring them home again. Why does he do it? It's out of love to the Lord Jesus. Peter, if you love me, you'll love what I love. It's not that we always love the sheep. Sometimes the sheep are stinky and wayward and troublesome and get us up in the middle of the night. But because we love the shepherd, we love what he loves. And he said, if you love me, you'll tend my sheep. You'll, you'll care for my lambs. Now, You'll notice that the elders are always seen in plurality in the New Testament. And they are not to be overseen by a particular individual, a leading brother, a ruling elder, a clergyman, a pastor. The only time we read about one man who is calling the shots, his name is Diotrephes. There are only two occasions in the New Testament where we read about preeminence, and one is God has seen fit to give his son the place of preeminence, and the other is Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence. And woe betides the man who arrogates to himself the preeminence which belongs alone to the Lord Jesus. The sharing of the oversight in the local church means that the elders are humble servant men. They're cooperative men. In fact, one of the disqualifications of an elder is that he's unruly. In other words, he's not able to work with other men. He's a, he's a lone ranger, and he, he does what he wants to do. He acts independently, and if he does that, he needs to be dealt with by the other elders. When there's an elder who throws temper tantrums if he doesn't get his way, in other words, he's soon angry, says the Bible, the, the flock shouldn't have to suffer under that. The other elders need to take responsibility. And they need to, to say to that brother, brother, uh, we don't want your will here. We don't want our will either. We want the Lord's will. And this is his assembly. It's not yours. It's not ours. It's his. And so the Lord has seen fit, because the scripture says in the multitude of counselors their safety, 
He's seen fit to give us a group of elders. We're different. We're all different. You have abilities that we don't have. We need you. But you know, you need us too. And we need to work together in this. And so elders, it, it takes a great deal of courage, I understand, and, and sometimes they'll throw another little fit when you say things like that. And you say, brother, please, that, that's, that's not appropriate behavior for someone of your age and maturity. That's not the way to, I mean, we're big men, let's talk like men, let's not act like little children here. You need to communicate to us, tell us what, what you're feeling, and we're happy to listen, but we are not going to let you Run the assembly here. It's not yours to run. And I think it's, it's so many of God's people have been grieved in their spirit because the elders have not been prepared to take the heat. Some years ago when my daughter was in uh, high school or just going into high school, uh, the principal of the school allowed one of the teachers to plan to take them to see a movie an R-rated movie of all things. And so I called him up and I said, I'd like to see him. So I went around to see the principal and um, I said that I was very concerned at uh, the decision that he'd made. And he said, well, I said, you know, isn't violence a problem in our culture? And he said, well, uh, some people would say the Bible is a violent book. I said, you're not going to use that argument, are you? He said, well, what would you say if I did use it? And I said, well, you know, the Bible is the book of ultimate action and consequence. It shows the relationship. God is honest. He tells the story of the human race as it happens. And, and he shows the relationship between action and consequence. There is no gratuitous violence in the Bible. And he said, well, um, you know, that's a point well taken. And he said, you know, you're the only parent who complained. I said, oh, I know how the statistics work. If um, there had been some religious activity and one parent had complained, what would you do? Oh, he said, touche. I said, yeah, I know how the numbers work. I said, I've got, a, I've got a way to fix this thing. You give my daughter your salary and we'll call it even. He said, why? I said, well, you see, you're paid that exorbitant salary out of my taxes to take the heat. And you buckled to the pressure of that teacher because you didn't want to do it, did you? He said, no. He said, you're right. I did. I buckled. I said, see, now my daughter's taking the heat. She's the only one who's not going. And that's exactly the situation in the local assembly that if the elders don't stand up to an unruly elder, then it's the Christians who suffer. And the elders need to take that responsibility in hand. God has not designed the local church to be um, controlled by one man. He has designed it to be shared by a group of humble servant men who want to care for his flock. And so... This leadership that God has designed, and only male leadership, we'll talk about that uh, in another study in Lesson 9, why it is only male leadership. But um, I would mention here that when you identify with a local church, you come into the fellowship of that local church, there are some people who see immediately the privileges. They like that. There are other people who see the responsibilities. In fact, they want responsibility. They want to preach. They want the Sunday school class. They want to be involved. But there is a third essential part to fellowship in the local church, and that is submission to the elders. It's a responsibility we have. Elders cannot have responsibility if they don't also have authority. They're going to give an account for our souls someday, and so they have to have Authority. Now, we're going to see the limitations of that authority. We heard recently from a preacher who said elders have absolute authority. It isn't true. Only God has absolute authority. Elders do not have sovereignty. God has sovereignty. Elders have vested authority, and that vested authority has limitations. Thank God for that, brethren. You don't want to take more responsibility than you, than you have to. You already have a very heavy load in caring for the souls of God's people. 
But God uh, has set very clear limits to the responsibility of the elders in the local church. You know, sometimes, as I say at the end of that first paragraph on page 26, that the elders should recognize they have no jurisdiction outside of assembly life. They should act as loving fathers, not lording it over God's heritage. One of the, one of the clear statements of scripture regarding fathers is, don't frustrate your children. Don't do this. Don't do that. No, you can't do No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. It frustrates them. And there are some people who have left a local church fellowship and gone elsewhere, and they have been thought of very poorly, when in reality, in the words concerning Diotrephes, he forced them out of the church. There are those who force the sheep away, and it's a solemn thing when they do that, when the elders actually scatter the sheep instead of gathering them and caring for them. We see the elders' qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and also in Titus chapter 1 and to some degree in 1 Peter chapter 5 and in a very beautiful way in the Gospel of John in the Lord's description of his own shepherd care and then in a beautiful way in Psalm 23 where the contented sheep describes all that the shepherd does for that little lamb. And you'll notice if you look at the verbs in Psalm 23, they're all passive. There are things that he's doing for me. He leads, he feeds, he guides, he provides. All the way through, the shepherd is looking after the sheep. So you can take Psalm 23 as a beautiful devotional portrait of what the sheep thinks of a good shepherd. And you can apply that to the life of the elder. I mention here that there are two extremes to be avoided in this regard. One is to make too little of these qualifications. There are some people say, well, when I look at that list, uh, nobody's that good. Nobody's like that. That must be just something to aim for. No, the word that is used must be is the word he's bound to be those things. These are the minimum requirements for an elder. On the other hand, there are people who take that list and they make it more than it says. They make it out that your children all have to be saved children. I'm not sure when it says believing, I think what that means is that these children recognize in their father spiritual leadership. They recognized his moral suasion. It, there's no, I mean, how could God ever hold a man responsible that his children be saved? That's, that's not true, is it? Uh, but, but it is true that the children, whether saved or not, recognize their father's spiritual stature. In other words, if your children don't take you seriously, God says, don't touch my family because they won't take you seriously either. It's important, uh, and, and as I mentioned here, uh, it doesn't mean that elders have had clear sailing with their families. Anybody who's had children knows you have struggles, and it's a great thing for elders to be honest about their struggles with their family. That's what gives you credibility. Your stock doesn't go down, it goes up. When you say, look, we've had some struggles in this area, and the Lord has helped us through it. And it encourages the saints to know that, that the elders, they know what you're talking about when you're talking about struggles in our homes and with our family. So it's not a matter of our children being perfect by any means. We need to pray for the children of the elders because they come under special attack. If the devil can't get at the man, he'll go after his wife. And if he can't get at his wife, he'll go after his children. And we need to pray for the protection of the elders' families because they come under special attack. When we look at this description of the elder, we have to remember that they are examples to us. And so if the elders are to be like this, we're to be like that too, aren't we? We're to be hospitable. We're not to be soon angry. We're not to get drunk. We're to be like they are, but they must be those things. So the standard is not, I don't think, unreasonably high, unless we make it so, unless we redefine these terms as if we're describing perfect elders. That's not the case. They do have their responsibilities. They do have 
their requirements, and we have them listed for us in the lower half of page 26. The family qualifications, the husband of one wife, literally a one woman man. It means a man who is loyal in his relationship. He is not a flirt. He is not someone who thinks little of his relationship to his wife. And before an elder should ever be identified, recognized in the local church, it would be good to ask his wife what she thinks of his spiritual leadership, because that's going to be a good measure, isn't it, of his leadership in the local church. Does he have his own house in order, having his children in subjection with all gravity, because if a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, God says, keep your hands off mine if you can't look after your own family. Now, if a man has trouble with his family, well, he's free to step down. Again, he can go on shepherding. Why did God get Solomon to write the books on how to raise children? <laughs> how to look after your son? Well, at least he knew what not to do, didn't he? And many a man who's struggled with his family has more compassion and care for the families than someone who seems to have clear sailing. I had a lady say to me one time, do you see that boy over there? That's my third son. You know, he's the one that taught me to be gracious with other families. She said, I had three children before him, and they all went straight as arrows. And I used to look at other families and wonder, what is their problem? And then he came, and he's taught me to be gracious with other families. <laughs> And then there are social qualifications. He must have a good report of those who are without. How does he do his business in the community? Does the community think well of him? He represents the assembly in the community. He represents the local church. And it's a sad thing, isn't it? When a man le leads a double life, he's one thing in the assembly, he's another thing at work. His employees at work, his neighbors, they ought to think highly of him too. He has a reputation, not only for himself, but a reputation for the whole, um, the whole assembly. There are moral qualifications. You notice them. He's not unruly. He's not soon angry, not hot-tempered. He's patient. He's not a brawler. He's not covetous. In other words, he can talk reasonably with people. He doesn't bully people. These are the requirements of an elder. Doctrinal qualification, he has to be able to teach. Able to teach. Now, it may not be publicly. He may be very good at taking a few young Christians into his home and explaining the basic principles of baptism and fellowship and, and witness and confession and, and uh, spiritual growth, spiritual development. That's great. That's wonderful. He may be good at going and visiting the widows and the old folks and sitting down and opening the scriptures and feeding their souls and encouraging them. It doesn't necessarily mean from the public platform. But the elders should be able to handle the word of God, to shut the mouths of those who, who um, would undermine the assembly, not rudely, but with meekness, those who oppose themselves to, to com convince them out of the scriptures where they're wrong. So the elders are, are supposed to be able to teach. We should not have some sort of rotating pulpit surface where the elders simply arrange for visiting preachers to come through and do all the teaching. When there's a problem in the assembly then, Christians have no loyalty to these elders. You see, if the elders do the majority of teaching, I owe them because they've taught me the word of God. Paul said, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And so when there are problems and the elders say, this is bad, bad news, we don't want to go this way, the Christians respond happily. They say, well, these are the men who've taught us the word of God. They know what they're talking about. They know the word of God, and we have confidence in them. The elders need to be able to teach. And then they're not novices. And we'll have a little discussion about that matter. I think that's a variable to some degree. Uh, an elder of a new fledgling assembly, as long as he's ahead of the other Christians, he qualifies to be an elder. Uh, if he goes to a more mature assembly, he may not qualify, but in this case, he would. Notice the elder's responsibilities at the pay top of page 27. They should uh, feed the flock of God, teach the whole counsel of God, 
Brethren, don't major in minors. Give a good, solid, regular, consistent view of Scripture to the people of God. They need good food. And you know, feeding the flock of God is great preventive medicine to keep from having a lot of sick sheep. And then protecting the assemblies from false teachers, caring for the sick, especially those who need spiritual restoration. It's not the elders driving around with three-in-one oil in their glove box. It's the Christians themselves on their sick bed realizing I'm in bed because of a sin in my life. And they acknowledge that before God. They call for the elders. The elders come. They make confession. They're restored to fellowship. And the anointing oil is a picture of the restoration of the ministry of the Spirit of God, the, the, the repair that has been done, and they're healed because the reason for their sickness was personal sin. Now, we shouldn't assume that if someone's sick, they must have sinned. That's the responsibility of the soul before God, and when they respond to that, they recognize their need, and they make confession, and the elders pray for them, and they're healed. So that's a key, isn't it? Um, to guide the assembly by godly example and biblical precept. I want to stress here uh, that not only are the, the elders responsible to restore the backslider, to seek the restoration of those who have wandered away, uh, but they are to guide the assembly. And uh, here I want to bring in a little issue here that is very important. The elders do not control family life. Christ is the head of the church. The husband is the head of the home. And no elder should be going in and telling people how to look after their home life. Now, elders care about home life. We pray for our families. They provide counsel and guidance, but they don't dictate in the, in the family life of the Christians in the local church. It's a dangerous thing when that happens. As well, they are not to control evangelism. You'll see this uh, very clearly in the story of uh, the, the early church in Acts 13, where uh, they prayed all night, and the Lord revealed to them, I have called these men. They didn't commend them to the work. That's a, an unbiblical phrase, to commend people to the work. You commend them to the grace of God. And God calls them and commissions them and provides for them you see, elders are inward-looking. By the very nature of elders, they care for the flock. They care about the health of the local church. And if you leave it to the elders to do evangelism, you know what kind of evangelism they'll have. Let's do it in the building and let's fill the building. Because that's what elders think about. That's not the role of evangelism. The role of the evangelist is to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. And so it's not, the, it's not the role of elders to control evangelism or the evangelists. It's, it's the work of the Holy Spirit of God to equip evangelists and to thrust them out. And it's only the responsibility of the elders to recognize what the Holy Spirit is doing and to commend them to the grace of God, to have spiritual fellowship, financial fellowship with them, and support them, to pray for them by all means. But it's not the right the responsibility of elders to control evangelism. Otherwise, they'll keep it contained within the local church, and that's not the place for evangelism. We're not trying to see the saints saved. We have to get out there where the sinners are and go out into the world to preach the gospel. So the elders are not responsible for um, the individual burden and exercise of Christians regarding evangelism, and they are not responsible for family life. They are to pray for them, to encourage them, to be available, to be counsel, to be encouragers, but they are not, they do not have authority over those areas. Well, I've talked a little bit about discipling young believers. That is such a key thing, isn't it? And it's an area that we're not always very good at. Older men working with younger men, getting them ready so they can carry on the work, pass on the baton, in a smooth and efficient way so there are young men coming along to take on the task. Unfortunately, what often happens, the man hangs on till the day he dies, drops the baton on the ground, and somebody has to come along and find out how to do it from scratch. That is not a good policy, is it? So 
we see the, the need for disciple making, for training the next generation. First of all, because it's the express will of God. Secondly, because it's the only way to accomplish the Great Commission. We need to multiply ourselves. And thirdly, because it's the way to lay a sure foundation for the next generation. Committed to faithful men who will teach others also. The question is, is this present generation actively engaged in passing on the truth, this sacred treasure, in pristine condition in the way we have received it from the Lord out of his word? That's the, that's the task, isn't it? And, and we, we have no time to waste. I look around Northern Ireland today and I see one of the best crops of young people coming along that I've ever seen. They are not rebels. The la there was a generation that really were. But this generation, they're happy to submit. They want to learn. They want to be a help. They are not antagonistic to the elders of the local church. They want, they want to be young disciples for Christ. They want to learn. They want to do it right. And we need to help them to do that. And you say, well, I'm afraid I, could, I don't know enough. Well, what do you know? Do you know how to use a concordance? Then take a young person, bring them to your home, show them how to use a concordance, how to find the meaning of a word. Do you know how to visit in the hospital? Do you know how to visit the saints? Well, then take somebody along with you and show them how to do that. No teacher is expected to take a child from kindergarten through university. But you can take them for part of that. You can show them what you do know. And if you don't know much, well, tell them that. Say, well, I, you know, I didn't have anybody show me, and I'm afraid I don't know very well how to do this, but let's learn together. Let's get out the books and let's learn together. You, you will gain the confidence of the young people if, you, if you're willing to be transparent and to encourage the development of the next generation. We desperately need it. And I've got a list here. We're not going to take the time. A list here of the things that we need to uh, sort of the bullseye, the objective. If, if we're going to see young people become the people God wants them to be for the next generation, they have to learn to be stewards and servants and witnesses and students and warriors and fruit bearers, for example. And so we say, well, if that's the objective, if that's where they have to be, then what are the incremental steps that will bring them from where they are now to where they should be? What are the skills necessary to become a good so soldier, a good warrior? Um, memorizing good gospel verses, understanding what the gospel is, understanding what the needs of people are, how to communicate the gospel, how to pray for the lost, those kinds of things. Uh, what makes a good gospel tract? Uh, how to befriend unbelievers uh, in a way that doesn't compromise your Christian standards, but also makes an avenue for the gospel. These things are things that young people need to learn. They want to learn, and we should give them opportunity to develop in these ways. Well, I, I leave that with you. Uh, there's another whole section in the back that talks about um, uh, the kinds of things that we need to do uh, to help develop our young people. But here we have the last little section, the response of the flock to the shepherds. It's the responsibility of the people of God to obey those who have the rule over us. Unfortunately, I have the wrong reference in the point one there. Um, Hebrews chapter 13 has two specific references to elders. We should remember them who have the rule over us or who are guides for us. Uh, to remember them. It doesn't mean, what is his name? I know I've met him before. What it means is to keep them in mind, keep them in your prayers, keep them in your words of encouragement. I was so thrilled to hear of a group of young people in Washington, D.C., who planned a special banquet of thanks for their elders. They went out and bought a, a nice book each, thankfully from Gospel Folio. They wrapped it up. They put a little note in it thanking them for being their elders, and they put on this banquet. It was lovely. I was in a, a place uh, in, in uh, the Maritimes where an elder came out to show me a homemade card that four couples had made to thank the elders for being shepherds for them. His eyes were filled with tears, and he said to me, do you think we're the only elders that ever got a card like this? Shame on us if, that, if that's the case how we ought to thank God for our elders and to tell them so. Don't wait till their funeral to tell what nice things
things they have done. Let them know now. Look for things that will encourage them. You know how you're encouraged when somebody says, I appreciate that about you. I thank God for you. Well, you look for the good things. The scripture says here, follow their faith. Follow their faith. Everybody has foibles and failures. You wouldn't follow Moses the way he got along with his wife. You wouldn't follow David the way he raised his boys. But surely you can follow some things in their lives. So don't accentuate the foibles and failures of the elders. Look for the areas in which they've been faithful. He's raised his family well. He's been a good uh, servant in the church here. He's, he's cared for the poor, the widows, whatever the case might be. He's a generous giver. Uh, he's a good Bible teacher. Tell them so. Let them know. I, I remember uh, the, the lines used to stick on a bumper sticker, have you hugged your kids today? And I, I thought it would be a nice bumper sticker to get, have you hugged an elder today? Let the elders know that you care, that you're, that you're thankful for them. It will do them and you both a world of good. We should esteem them highly for their work's sake. Now, the Bible says to honor the king. The king at that time was Nero. He was not honored because he was honorable. He was to be honored because someday he'd give an account for the Roman Empire. And so we too should honor our elders, not because they necessarily always do the right thing, but because someday they will give an account for our souls. What a solemn thing it is. And we should esteem them highly for their work's sake. We should pray for them and we should entreat them as fathers. And so may the Lord encourage us to be good little sheep and to be encouraging to the elders and to look for ways to enhance the meetings of the church, to encourage the health and welfare of the whole assembly. And for those of you young men who have a heart to be a help to the people of God, you need to get in the book. You need to be hospitable. Even if you don't have a house, you can take someone up to McDonald's. You need to be learning how to counsel, how to care for God's people, how to look after the widows. You need to be doing these things now. You don't get to be an elder all of a sudden when you get a little gray in your temple. You have to be a good younger before you become a good elder. Now's the time to get started and to start doing the work. No one should be shocked when you're recognized as, as an elder. It's a shameful thing when somebody says, why is he an elder? Better to say, why isn't he an elder? It's a lot easier to get them on than it is to get them off, you know. And so we don't lay hands suddenly on anyone. We want to see them grow and develop before our eyes. Now's the time to get started. Now's the time. Let's just close with a short word of prayer. Our Father, again, as we have opened thy word, we have that sense that the hand of God is upon us, that the one who inspired it is here tonight, and he is working in our hearts, and he's encouraging us, and he's showing us things. And uh, we, we're grateful for the elders who are here, we're grateful for the young people who are here. We're grateful for those who have never been called to be elders, but have faithfully served God's people in some of the uh, thankless jobs in the life of the local church. Those who have opened the door and swept the floor and straightened the hymn books and smiled and encouraged in the backgrounds and taught the Sunday school class and paid the bills and changed the light bulbs and done a thousand other things that were unheralded and unknown, but have been recognized in heaven and will someday bear the smile of the Lord Jesus as he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And so we thank thee that we are all helpers, workers together, and pray that each of us might make full proof of our ministry, whatever that might be, that we might be cooperative and helpful with one another. We pray especially tonight for those in the audience and those not in the audience who are struggling in a difficult situation. We wouldn't trivialize it. We wouldn't make light of it. It's tough. It ought to be a happy thing to go in fellowship with the people of God. But some of them are rent with, with discouragement and sorrow and frustration. Oh God, come in and encourage them tonight. Know they're being prayed for. Know they're not alone. The, the chief shepherd is looking down and he's grieving, but he has resources that we don't have. He's able to get into the hearts, to show us the way into the hearts of those who may have fortified themselves against us. 
Help us to be the agents of thy love and to, to claim with all our hearts the truth that love doesn't fail. We give thee thanks for the day when we'll all be home and we'll all be perfect and beautiful. And nobody will cross the golden street to avoid anybody else. We'll be one big happy family. We're thankful that the one who resides within us will not give up on us, but will carry on until the day of Jesus Christ. We look forward to the day. But in the meantime, help us to cooperate with thee and to be a little help to thy people wherever we can, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. We ask in the Savior's name. Amen.